Welcome to episode 11 of Staging Shakespeare. Thanks for listening. I'm calling this episode Twins in Twelfth Night in order to differentiate it from episode 10, which was about twins in the comedy of errors. Though I have to admit that I did originally plan to do just one podcast about both of Shakespeare's twin plays, but it soon became obvious that to cram both plays into one podcast would not only be very difficult, but a little bit silly. So I've given Sebastian and Viola the time that they deserve by creating this podcast about them. <laughs> Most of you probably know that Shakespeare was himself the father of twins, Judith and Hamnet. In the period between the writing of The Comedy of Errors and Twelfth Night, Shakespeare suffered the loss of his son, Hamnet, who died in August 1596 at the age of 11. His cause of death is not recorded. We can only speculate, of course, about the effect that this death had upon William Shakespeare. But it would be strange to pretend that such a loss would not have been deep and powerful. So when the playwright turned his attention to the story of Viola and Sebastian, which he probably took from a short story by Barnaby Rich called Apollonius and Scylla, there are echoes of the loss of Hamnet which is difficult to ignore. After all, at the start of the play, Viola imagines her brother to have died in the shipwreck that washes her onto the shores of Illyria. Like Shakespeare's daughter Judith, she has to continue her life without the support of her twin brother. Right from the opening moments of the play, therefore, the twinning element is a more a source of tragedy than comedy marking out Twelfth Night as a very different piece of work from the Comedy of Errors. Even though the Comedy of Errors begins with a long speech by Aegean telling the story of the shipwreck in which he and one of the Antipholuses and one of the Dromios were separated from his wife Emilia and the other two boys, the story of their separation each fastened to a mast to save them from being drowned, comes across as more like a tragicomic fairy tale than a truly heart-rending event. Whereas in Twelfth Night, Viola, lamenting the death of her brother Sebastian, what should I do in Illyria? My brother, he is in Elysium has a more restrained and, consequently to my ears anyway, a more poignant and touching effect. Had he wanted to, Shakespeare could have given Viola a lengthy speech of wailing and woe like that of Aegean, but he chooses to restrict Viola's grief to a very few words, and in doing so he makes it all the more affecting and creates a completely different tone from that which opened the comedy of errors. Of course, the biggest difference between the twins in these two plays is that those in Twelfth Night are dizygotic or fraternal twins being male and female, as opposed to male, male or female, female, exactly the same as Shakespeare's own twins. And although the plot of Twelfth Night, like that of the Comedy of Errors, revolves around mistaken identity, it requires one of the twins, Viola, to pretend to be of a different gender in order that this mistake may be made. As a vulnerable, lone female, Viola chooses to dress as a man, with the assistance of the sea captain who has helped her ashore. And thus we are faced with the first staging problem, 
if we are in the process of putting on a production of the play? What clothes will Viola wear as she takes on the guise of Cesario and seeks to serve the governor of Illyria, Duke Orsino? Though I have many reservations about Trevor Nunn's 1996 film of Twelfth Night, in which Viola is played by Imogen Stubbs and her brother Sebastian by Stephen McIntosh, I find Nunn's solution to the clothing problem a very good one. As Viola lies distraught on the Illyrian shore, a sea chest is hauled from the sea by the sailors who, like her, have survived the wreck. Viola recognises it as her brother's, opens it and takes out one of his coats, a kind of military uniform, holding it to her breast as she questions the captain, saying, perchance he is not drowned. Later, in a sequence which forms a backdrop to the opening credits, we see Viola removing her female attire, cutting short her long hair, and dressing in her brother's uniform. There is an amusing moment when she realises that the bulges in her costume will be slightly wrong, so she tightly binds her breasts to flatten them and then stuffs a cloth down her trousers to give the necessary male genital bulge. At the end of the sequence we see her adding a final touch a wispy, false moustache, exactly like the one worn by her brother. Then she walks off in the direction of Orsino's castle to offer him her services. Although this is a great solution to the tricky costuming problem, one thing still nags at my mind. The pre credit sequence features a troop of Orsino's soldiers riding down to the beach, and Viola, the sea captain, and the other sailors are forced to hide from them in a cave. Why? The captain explains to Viola. The war between these merchants here and ours too oft has given us bloody argument. We must not be discovered in this place. Of course, although this is Cod Shakespeare inserted into the film by Trevor Nunn, it is reminiscent of the situation at the start of the Comedy of Errors, where Duke Solinus explains to Aegean why he has been arrested. Merchant of Syracuse, plead no more. I am not partial to infringe our laws. The enmity and discord which of late sprung from the rancorous outrage of your duke to merchants, our well-dealing countrymen, who wanting guilders to redeem their lives, have sealed his rigorous statutes with their bloods, excludes all pity from our threatening looks. Although this is a nice touch on the part of none, and... I forgive him for writing a bit of Cod Shakespeare to advance the plot. I've been guilty of doing the same myself at times in productions I've directed. It complicates matters somewhat. Because the question I now want to ask myself is this. Precisely what military uniform is Viola wearing? Is she wearing a uniform of messaline from which she and her brother come? If so, surely the uniform would in, be in some ways different from that of Illyria, if only in insignia. At worst, it would be immediately recognisable and lead to her being arrested rather than welcomed when she arrives at Orsino's court. So by creating this extra bit of conflict at the start of the play, none somewhat undoes his good idea that Viola gets access to one of Sebastian's uniforms when his sea chest is washed ashore. And we mustn't get confused with the conflict between Orsino and Antonio which we encounter later in the play. There's no suggestion in the play 
that Antonio is the captain of a ship from Messaline. Though he disdains Orsino's description of him as a pirate, his battle with Illyrian ships has no connection to a trade war with Messaline. So, leaving Antonio aside then, let's return to Viola's costume, because how we costume the twins in this play tells us something about the nature of the world of Illyria, as well as being a staging problem that we simply have to solve somehow or other. The search for a way to design Twelfth Night that solves the problem of Viola's costume has thrown up many answers. You only have to spend a few minutes googling images of the play to see how wide has been the search for solutions. Uniforms of one kind or another are probably top of the list. Griff Rhys Jones chose a Naval Academy setting for his 1991 RSC production with Sylvestre Latouzel as Viola. Michael Grandage at Wyndham's in London in 2008 dressed Viola as a, a sexily androgynous matador, in the words of The Guardian's Michael Billington. And American productions in particular seem to revel in the opportunity to costume Viola as, as a Confederate soldier or a pupil at West Point Military Academy. Evening dress of one kind or another follows closely behind as a favourite option, as does Elizabethan or Jacobean costume, allowing Viola to benefit, perhaps, from a codpiece. More modern productions have opted for a kind of Jack the Lad look, as if Viola might be mistaken for an East End Barrow boy. Why is any of this important? To my mind, it's because these costume choices set up vibrations through the world of the play and start to influence how it functions as a whole. Let me explain what I mean by that. Firstly, the highly popular military option. When Orsino is presented, as he is, for instance, by none in his film, as a militaristic ruler whose court is peopled by uniformed soldiers, it's difficult not to feel that Illyria has a slightly repressive atmosphere. This is quite a strict world, where upper lips are inevitably stiff and boots and buttons must gleam. So how does this harmonise with Orsino's desire to run off to sweet beds of flowers, where love thoughts lie rich when canopied with bowers? To be honest, I don't think it does. A militaristic Orsino would surely prefer a cold shower. Quite simply, I don't find a military design suits the play at all. And what about evening dress? It doesn't really work for me either. An Orsino, who looks as if he's about to conduct an orchestra surrounded by what can only be described as a household of stuffed shirts leaves me disengaged. Again, it's partly to do with excessive formality that I associate with evening dress. Maybe if I'd been to Eton or Harrow I'd feel differently. Who knows? <laughs> Where does that leave us then? I'm looking for a design which will solve two staging problems. The problem of Viola passing herself off as a man and the problem of an Illyria which seems to suit the kind of Orsino I find in the text. 
Let me offer you just one example. I'm sure there could be many others. In 2017, the RSC staged a production of the play directed by Christopher Luscombe. It starred Adrian Edmondson from the anarchic TV sitcom The Young Ones as Malvolio and was set in the 1890s by designer Simon Higlett. Now, I didn't think much of Edmondson as Malvolio or Cara Toynton's Olivia, but this isn't the place to go down that particular road. What I did love about the production, though, was what Michael Billington described as the languidly luxuriant, sexually ambivalent household of Orsino, played by Nicholas Bishop. This atmosphere was heightened by the use of costuming, which reminded us of the fact that Queen Victoria delighted in the employment of an Indian servant, Abdul Karim. So not only was Olivia's Fool Feste played by an Asian actor, Berus Khan, but both Viola and Sebastian were played by actors of Asian heritage, Dinita Gohill playing Viola and Esh Aladi, her brother. Both were costumed in Indian-styled clothes, though the question of where Viola got hers to replace the sari she wore at the start was left unresolved. The idea that they might be mistaken for one another was, in my opinion, adequately overcome. And the idea that Nicholas Bishop, as Orsino, might wish to leave the stage in search of a canopied bower where love thoughts might lie rich among sweet beds of flowers, seemed to me to be perfectly possible. And so from that point of view, I found the production very satisfying. It was, shall we say, an elegant solution. So that's all for episode 11. Do remember that you can email me at podcaststagingshakespeare at gmail.com. I hope you've enjoyed thinking about twins in Twelfth Night. Thanks for listening. Bye now. Bye.